what lesson create is uh, Andrew Stuck, uh, who came with this idea of a day long global celebration of sound walking to the maid of walking encounters in France uh, some years ago. And now this one day has grown to 30 days of sound walking. Uh, Babak uh, Fakam Sade is a digital artist and Sakio choreographer. He's always uh, cool and leading under myself to all digital storms and crises, and he has his own crisis today, which is his birthday, <laughs> and of course, uh, myself. Uh, this program of uh, events has also two collective collaborative actions uh, to which you are invited uh, to participate. It's called Shorelines. You find a link in the uh, chat. It's about writing a text and reciting in places between land and water. And the second collaborative action uh, to which you are invited is called 30 days of walking and is inviting you to record a walk on a day of your choice and to upload it. Uh, so we compose a 30 day sound walk in September. And there are many programmed events of sound walk September um, that you can participate to. So you are warmly invited to have a look to these uh, and to our Next curated talks tomorrow with Julie Portas Santos, who invited scientists and artists to talk about fieldwork. And on Monday with Jess Hastings, who invited speakers on slowness and on stumbling. Soundwalk September is made possible by the selfless dedication and the great effort of many contributors without any structural funding or financial support. So if you like us, please support us by participating in more events and as well by sharing the events um, wherever you can in your social networks. And tonight I would like to introduce you to Viv, uh, Viv Corrigan. She's a British-born US-based singer who for the past 40 years has followed an inspiring path as a singer and as a vocalist across free improvisation, Greek, Rambetica, Turkish folk and other styles of music often combined with environmental field recordings made during solo walks. Her uh, work includes concerts, sound walks, radio works and multi-channel installations. She is interested in exploring the sense of place and how it links with personal history and memory. Her uh, many awards include uh, two McKnight Composer Fellowships to the American Composers Forum. She holds an MA in Sonic Art from Middlesex University, London, and she also studied and performed with Pauline Oliveros and holds a DJ certificate of, for deep listening. She facilitates workshops in sounding and listening, most recently in Hong Kong, London, Bangalore, New York, Kolkata and Manila. That is a global uh, sound walk September festival on its own. And we invited Viv to curate a talk for sound walk September, for which she invited two intriguing sound artists, Amanda Gutierrez and Jimena Rarcon to present their work and for a conversation together with Viv and the public. Viv. Thank you very much, Kiet. It's really great to be here. Um, I always enjoy these events that, that the three of you have created, and this is, this is a wonderful opportunity for me to introduce these two really interesting and talented artists. Um, and I really admire their work, and I think you're going to enjoy these presentations. And they are Amanda Gutierrez and Jimena Alarcon. And um, I'm going to start by introducing Amanda. We met in New York uh, when we both were living there. I still am living there. And I was really interested in the VR videos, the three-dimensional videos she made based on sound walks she was leading in Brooklyn. So Amanda was born in Mexico City. She graduated initially as a stage designer from the National School of Theater. She uses a range of media, such as film and performance art, to investigate how the conditions of everyday life set the stage for our experiences, and in doing so, shape our individual and collective identities. Approaching questions from the sound walk perspective continues to be of special interest to Gutierrez, who completed her MFA in media and performance studies at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. 
and is currently elaborating the academic dimension of her work. Accordingly, these techniques also constitute the core of the pedagogical practice Gutierrez has developed over a decade of teaching in diverse settings, including academic institutions such as the SAIC, Connecticut College, and NYU Abu Dhabi. And I believe she's in Helsinki at the moment, though she also has, <laughs> has been moving around a lot. Uh, I knew her in New York, and uh, then she was in Montreal, and then she was in Dubai, and I believe she's in Helsinki, or at least she was yesterday. So I'd like to hand over to Amanda Gutierrez. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I'm currently... Um, is stranded and I will give an explanation about why in my presentation, which is actually related to site specific walks that I, um, I'm very interested in when I arrive to a place or when I am a, uh, in a transition stage in the space. Walking has been one of the main mediums for me to actually uh, develop these relationships with the space and relationship of gender. So I will, um, for my presentation, because I have a lot of B-roll to show, and as you might know, um, these interfaces are very, very unstable, especially when it comes for uh, to listen voices and to watch moving images, videos. So I actually edited a uh, video presentation for you. It's only 10 minutes but um, I think it's going to be uh, way more engaging to have that than just looking at my face for 10 minutes. I, I try to develop this. So actually, if you find interesting certain parts um, of the video, uh, I will be very happy to share with you any uh, like websites or um, materials that are listed in there, which are actually listed as well in my video Vimeo page. So Thanks so much, Amanda. Um, it's a wonderful video. I mean, your work is, is so rich and, you know, includes so many really wonderful and important things. I think that the work you're doing is very important, you know, in terms of women and migrants and the whole femicide thing. It's, uh, yeah, it's quite extraordinary. I, I'm watching that video now for the second time. And uh, I think there's, you know, there's a lot more there for me to find. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Um, so we will we'll move on to Jimena Alarcon, um, who I knew when we both lived in London. And like me, she studied with Pauline Oliveros to teach deep listening. And I find her, um, her telematic performances um, and all the work around telematic, uh, telematics between places, you know, very distant places and people, I find it really interesting. And of course, you know, extremely relevant in these times. So um, I'll just tell you a little bit about her. Um, Jimena is a sound artist and researcher interested in listening to in-between spaces, dreams, underground public transport, and the migratory context. She creates telematic improvisations using deep listening and interfaces for relational listening. She has a PhD in music technology and innovation from De Montfort University and is a deep listening certified tutor. So her major artistic research projects are the online environment sounding underground, the telematic performances networked migrations, and Intimal, an embodied physical virtual system for relational listening in telematic sonic performance. Jimena is currently a senior tutor in the online deep listening certification program offered by the Center for Deep Listening. And she works independently in the second phase of the Intimal project that involves an embodied physical virtual system for sensing place and presence between distant locations and a co-creation laboratory for listening to migrations for Latin American migrant women. Over to you, Jimena. 
Okay, well, thank you very much for that introduction, Viv. Um, and for everyone who is here and for the invitation um, to this amazing community, which actually I didn't know, but it's um, is really nice <laughs> introduction for me. So in these minutes, um, I realized when Viv um, asked me about uh, talking about uh, my work uh, in relation to walk. So uh, I was reflecting. Um, and today I, well, I realized that the perspective that I want to offer you is um, as a migrant artist. And, and I want to, um, basically because when we migrate, we, we suffer dislocation and, and the walking amongst others is, is a great metaphor uh, for finding your bearings, finding location. So also when you migrate, you lose your interfaces. <laughs> so I think I've been in, in search for my interface, um, but I didn't really, I didn't call it like that, but this is why I've been working uh, with the interfaces, or, uh, creating interfaces um, that depart from um, infrastructure um, transport infrastructure, and then um, incorporates all what is internet, which is another infrastructure basically for navigation. So today I want to focus in two examples. One that is one of my, let's say, oldest project, which is Sounding Underground, and the latest, which is Intima, uh, because I think there are things that are a constant there. So sounding on the ground, oh, well, I, the way that I'm, I'm going to talk, but also I would present links, uh, links for information, and also I would present links for you to watch um, uh, specific minutes of, of videos. So during my talk, I will take you to three times to watch little bits of videos, and other um, uh, links are for information. So, uh, sounding on the ground. Sounding on the ground is um, is a virtual environment. It's a virtual online sonic virtual environment, um, which brings together the experience of um, uh, commuters in three underground transport systems in the world: London, Paris, and Mexico, listening to their commute. So, during the commute, as probably many of you uh, have been commuters. You walk, you walk in an infrastructure, um, but also you are being carried. You are being carried by trains, by escalators, by lifts, which interrupt your walking. So that was very interesting in my research, um, which I did originally for my PhD, was only about London. And then I had the opportunity to do a postdoctoral uh, fellowship where I uh, incorporate experience in Paris and Mexico that also brings different rhythms in each city and how different cultures or the moment in which the underground came into, into the city um, interferes with people's rhythms. So that was very interesting for me in sounding underground. So I created um, this uh, virtual environment, which has been live since 2009. It was built in for navigation on the internet with the, um, the environment of flash, flash players. So I invite you, not, not right now, but in your own time, to experience this work, which was really, I gave lots of time to this work and collect so many experiences of um, 19 commuters in London, 16 commuters in Mexico City, and 16 commuters in, Me in Paris. Um, also to listen via headphones and to use Flash Player. Unfortunately, in December this year, Flash Player will stop uh, working. So this is the end of this project, which is really beautiful. I will, I have the co documentation in video, but as it is in this moment interactive, you have three months <laughs> to enjoy. Um, 
Okay, so basically, um, I would like to give you just one minute to uh, experience sounding on the ground because this environment, um, I created uh, spaces where you work, like the entrance tickets, um, platforms, um, trains, and, um, and corridors, um, but also I created imaginary spaces. And one of the places that I created is shared steps. So you will listen to the steps of people in London, the steps in people in Mexico, and the steps in people in Paris. And um, so I will just share with you this. Um, so if you go to this Vimeo, video in Vimeo, if you play from minute four, So with this work, and I have um, written um, about it, um, about it's about embodiment also kind of linking some things with, with Amanda too, um, and how um, we have agency and also their, how the urban infrastructure also control us. Um, I didn't know how, um, and the emotions that they produce. Uh, for example, in London, uh, how nervous a uh, passenger was sharing with me when he goes walking and she go he goes to the escalator, he doesn't know if to continue walking with the escalators or, or leaving himself to, to continue. So this is very, very interesting for me uh, as part of walking. Um, and my recent, recent project, that was 2009, and now we go back to um, 2000, um, uh, 17. So now a bit about Intimal. Intimal um, is a project to listen to our migrations. And um, Intimal is, um, is a system, a physical virtual system for relational listening, exploring um, sense of place and sense of presence. So these are the kind of common preoccupations for someone who migrates, where to find your bearings, the things that it used to attach you to place, uh, they are not attaching you anymore. You don't have attachments. So you need to find something. Uh, you wonder about that, as well as a sense of presence. How, if, you, if your presence continue in the place where you are coming from. So um, this is related to telematic sonic performance and to I, I've been working with telematic sonic performance um, when people are sitting as we are with these um, means, mediums, um, but I wanted something in movement. I wanted something in walking. So I went for two years to work in this project Intimal, uh, thanks to a Marie Curie Fellowship in the University of Oslo. And, um, and I develop in collaboration with nine Colombian migrant women and uh, listening to their migrations in different cities in Europe. Um, and I propose to them um, to listen to their migrations and to have another journey. This time it's not in the underground, but in their memories. And it's a migratory journey. So this is the scheme of, of to guide people to imagine what is their migratory journey. Uh, to walk in their memories. This scheme was also part of, a, um, derived from um, oral testimonies that I heard from women, uh, migrant women who have been forced to migrate uh, from Colombia because of the Colombian conflict. So I tried to, to categorize all these testimonies and I found that the stories were going in these, in these spheres, what I call spheres of migratory memory. So in the work that I developed with these uh, Colombian women, I asked them to, to after lots of uh, deep listening work with them, to perform or to improvise their migratory journey. So their migratory journey is imagining going there, it's an improvisation. And um, they, they have their migratory journey in, in trios. Um, and where one person is telling the migratory journey where the others are resonate. So I will invite you to, 
play this video, they are in the motion in a motion capture lab for that reason they look like that. Um, and also um, because uh, it's for for privacy um, of their image. So after all, these experiments were to bring narratives and also to create interactively, how can I use um, uh, these amazing things that I was uh, seeing? So I created two modules. One is, um, is a, uh, a mobile um, navigator with a mobile phone. They can navigate through virtual, uh, through archives, oral archives uh, of the testimonies. And also they have breathing sensors because walking ain't interrelated with breathing. So walking as a sensing place, so to be able to be in that physical space and breathing as a way to feeling each other across distant locations. So for the final performance after developing all the technology, I created this, this performance. So this is kind of the intimal project. Now um, there is a, um, a collective, uh, all these women who were participating in this uh, work. We continue uh, walking, well, let's say communicating or navigating in this medium, um, telematic medium um, and dreams. Um, and we do that monthly, <laughs> more or less. Um, and this is, what what I'm doing now, and I continue working in the interface. I still am in search for, with, for my interface, or for our interface, um, which integrates walking and breathing and a spoken word in this intricate, complex, but very uh, important relationship for agency. So thank you very much. Mm, thank you very much, Jimena. Uh, yeah, so wonderful, powerful way to bring people together. And I, I really like your idea of listening to embodied memories. That's, uh, <laughs> that's a really, really, really interesting. Thank you so much. So um, I am going to ask you a couple of a few questions, and then we'll open it up to anybody else who'd like to ask either Amanda or Jimena questions too. So. Um, I, actually, as we are talking about sound, I think the first question is uh, going to be, could each of you describe a sound on a walk that you remember for some reason? Maybe it stirred a strong emotion in you, or maybe there was some other reason why you remember it. <laughs> so um, let's start with Amanda. Yeah, and the sandbox that I shared with you in the video in Brooklyn in um, Sunset Park, I um, I think one of the most important sounds are the recognizable sounds that I have from the Mexican uh, diaspora. Um, and also, and, and this is because I'm always kind of homesick in a way. Right now, I've been losing so many homes or so many places, and I've been basically uh migrating body this year in so many places that i don't i think i stopped missing it's really strange i mean or stopped missing one place but when i was in new york i was missing mostly their relationship with the linguistic relationship with speaking spanish but specifically the spanish with the slang and this uh cultural forums that uh, the Mexican culture has. Mm. So when I was doing my sound walks, I stopped in places where I recognized myself with the sound. Ah. And then I took a picture of it. So I do remember the sound of of someone making um, quesadillas with hemp and with the dough. So that, that was something that um, struck me and also it make me rethink again my relationship with Brooklyn mm. and my relationship with that particular street, which is Fifth Avenue in mm. Sunset Park. Great, thanks. 
And Jimena, have you got a sound you remember particularly? Yeah, it came to me just now that you said, <laughs> and probably because of the link again with going back to sounding underground. But um, there is, a, when I arrive as a, as a migrant in London, um, the first thing that was so familiar for me was a floor in the London underground, um, which is, well, we have all sorts of material, but this is this kind of aluminium that um, is for to avoid uh, that you sleep, uh, uh, yeah, avoid a slippery surface. And um, this sounds a particular way if you are with a particular shoes. And um, the reason it was not s only sonic, but was a memory because it seems that by 2000s, this material started to be very important in the urban spaces and is the material that is used in Bogota, my native city, in something called Transmilenio, which is the integrated transport system, is, is a dedicated line for buses. Uh, so they created this bus stop uh, where people have to walk um, a lot and cross kind of um, pedestrian bridges. And this aluminium, with many people walking, makes incredible sound. So it's not necessarily um, a sound. I mean, it's extremely urban, extremely brutal. It's brutal. But it's this brutality that I was also missing from Bogota. And suddenly, the brutality of London Underground broke me. And I said, I know this. I know this brutality I, I'm from here and this space, London Underground, helps me to find my location because I'm dislocated. <laughs> so, so that and then when I go back to Bogota um, and I walk there, it has a belonging, even if I have not used a lot that transport system because it was in the time that I came here. But for me, it's so important. It's, it's, it's rough, it's brutal. Um, but it's, it's, um, it's, it's in the memory, it's emotional. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, oh, great, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so um, so I'm, I'm really interested in my work in walking as a way of tracing memory, and you've both spoken about this, um, but I wonder if you could just say a little bit more about that, that idea of walking and tracing memory um, in in your work. Um, and I think actually, let's start with you, Jimena, this time. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I see it in two ways, both in, in sounding underground, because when I work with, with commuters in all these cities, even if my idea was to work in a routine journey, my research question was, uh, what is left in your memories after the routine of going on and on every single day using the same um, uh, space. Um, so, so that, uh, it was incredible for them, first the invitation to listen and then to realize how expert they were and how emotional was your journey and to realize that uh, or for me to realize also as a researcher, as an artist, that each, each journey, when it's being heard with attention, becomes a metaphor of what is happening in each person's life at that time in life. So it's almost an oracle. <laughs> so, and then um, in terms of intimal, it's different because I, I create these, these bubbles, these spheres of migratory memory which I gave them in a paper. I work with non-trained performers. And they were sometimes they say, oh, which one was the North? Uh, I understood it in this way. And another say, I understood it in this other way. Um, and others probably who, who have more experience of working with the body, for example, I have a, a, in, in the collective, there is a dancer. And she said, I incorporated all the, the spheres inside my body. So there were many ways of tracing the memory, um, but I realized how important was that. I use this little, very simple scheme also in workshops with women in each city, Oslo, Barcelona, and London, where the, the project happened. Um, 
and I, they just did it with uh, with paper, with a pen. And I said, after doing this migratory journey, which is a bo free body voice improvisation, um, where were you more there? How, how was your your trace? So they trace actually with a pen, and then they realize, oh, I am mostly all the time in my in my native place. I'm not really in my hostland or I am in a balance. And because in any case, listening or this project for me is towards healing and finding a balance between this dislocation, precisely what Amanda is talking about. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's great. Uh, Amanda, do you have anything on this one? <laughs> yes, and the project that I show you with the senior center uh, that I developed in collaboration with seniors, um, it was very interesting because we did have to um, work in collaboration, not only walking. Walking was kind of like one of the last stages in order to work in their um, spatial memory of the places where they were born, they grew up, have changed. Um, we did other activities. Many of them was mapping before we went out to walk. So when we went out to walk, um, we actually realized that many of these soundscapes were already gone, but um, we wanted to translate those soundscapes through um, a storytelling way. So they wrote that, as you saw in the video. And then when we come back to the places that they narrated through their uh, short essays, it was very um, compelling to live with the essay and remember the essay and then listen the soundscape that has already changed um, mm -hmm. through the transition of walking and yeah and this also happened with the other project where we went to the places that already have changed through the gentrification project so walking and narrating the missing spaces or the spaces that no longer exist into this juxtaposition of what is in there at this moment. It was, uh, some of them, one of them starts crying because of course she saw her nonprofit organization where she grew up turn into a pizza place. <laughs> so that it was, it was a, a very strong journey through memory and, and space walk, through walk, through the action of walk. Mm, yeah, wow, interesting. Um, and the other question I wanted to ask you um, is maybe you could say a little bit more about the practice of walking in relation to the gender dynamics in public spaces. Um, and I'm going to start with you, actually, Amanda, because I know that's something dear to your heart. Yes, well, right now, I honestly, well, the first, one of the first walks that I did was with a friend of mine whose name is Jen. Jen Grossman, who is also, also she's a sound artist, and I think also she um, and, and I, uh, we were exploring neighborhoods in Brooklyn that maybe she was a little bit more familiar, I, I was new, but there was some kind of complicity, like some kind of interesting um, uh, relationship that was forming through the concept of walking in the night. Not having a direct direction, not having a, uh, um, a very clear direction, but just exploring, listening with our headphones and with um, our field recorder. Um, and I think that was the first walk from many walks that I start analyzing how this works in terms of walking with other women. Not because, I mean, I'm, I'm also right now trying to understand if I just want to walk with women or also with, I want to open up this question to a non-binary, the non-binary body, not necessarily women. Um, and, then, um, and then from there, how is the perception that we have? Most of the time, the people who I walk, which are uh, women, not all the time, um, but they express that they always have a fear and the fear, of being attacked, the fear of not being able to enter into a space. So in this sense, I, I'm walking, encountering 
what are the, not only the struggles, but what are the spaces that allow us to enter? What are the spaces that is restrained, uh, it, it has a restriction for us in where this restriction comes from? It's from our memory or it's from actually the space itself that has been built, has been built this uneasiness in, in terms of, um, you know, gender violence. And that it really much like varies from country to country and to culture to culture. Mm, yeah, great. Yeah, Jimena. Yeah, that uh, made me think of of two. Well, this very be related to uh, to what Amanda has said. Definitely, there is fear. Um, and I think of these two projects that I presented. Uh, so the, in the sounding on the ground, particularly, um, well, I would say, I mean, it's, it's stronger in Mexico, but that happens in Paris and London too. And is how safe, uh, let's say, the safety, well, it's n not everything is fully generalized, but the safety that being carried, <laughs> let's say, by the tube or by the metro creates when you, uh, when you are, let's say, escaping the streets. So you find that finally you are in the metro, you have a sense of, secu of safety, although we know in the carriages also in Mexico, there are times in which it's only carriages for women. Um, uh, so the, this is ab about mobility, not only walking, but about mobility. And in terms of the of migrants, working with migrants, specifically with uh, female migrancy, um, there is um, there is also a, a, a search for sense of agency. So in female uh, narratives of migrant of migrancy, there is a, a sort of liberation and opportunity to feel that the absences or presence um, that we used to have in our, let's say, native countries change completely when we move to a, to a, to a new place. So I see walking as an opportunity for transition, actually, for actually migrate. So it's a metaphor for me too, uh, a metaphor for change, for transformation, and for agency. Um, uh, in incorporated in, for example, interfaces or performance practices that I can uh, propose uh, for people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, I'm going to open it up in, in one minute, but just before that, <laughs> for the last minute I'm, um, I'm with you, I'm actually going to break with tradition and join in with you, because what I'm going to ask is, can you remember a walk where your breathing changed? And you don't have to tell us what it is, just think of a walk where your breathing changed. I've kind of got one. Um, and can you demonstrate what it changed to? So mine, I'm just going to demonstrate my breathing change to... <sighs> Amanda, do you have one? Yeah, I think it will be in the night with my friend Jen in Brooklyn, I remember smelling this very cold, cute, like it's kind of like between cold and humid. It was very cold actually. So I remember seeing like <laughs> listening my own breathing with a binaural headphones. Oh, yeah. And human, you, got one. <laughs> you, you don't have to tell us what it is. You could just just do it. <laughs> I like. I cannot help but going back to my <laughs> native place, and I will demonstrate. <sighs> right. Should we do it all together on a count of three? Yeah. One, yeah. two, three. <sighs> Thank you very much. Um, and now, anybody who um, who would like to ask a question? Uh, I know Andrew, actually, you had a question. Oh, and Babak does too. 
uh, I've, I'm, I'm currently editing a, uh, an interview with Nick Tyler, who's a professor of civil engineering at UCL, and he uses, um, uh, you know, a, a Pamela is a pedestrian laboratory. Pamela stands for a, a pedestrian something movement <laughs> uh, a laboratory. Uh, that's at Kentish Town, but they're building a new one, a much larger one, at the Stratford site for the Olympic Games. That area, and um, and and what they're doing is um, a, a lot of uh, a ver re recreation of infrastructure where people walk to find out how the uh, um, infrastructure uh, causes people to have um, increasing amounts of anxiety or not as they walk through the infrastructure caused uh, by either the uh, numbers of people, the uh, infrastructure itself, or more importantly, the noise that bounces off the walls and, and, and exacerbates um, their things. So they're looking at people's movement in, 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 in transit infrastructure. So that was one. And then um, uh, I interviewed Ella Parry Davis, who's done a lot of work on Filipino um, migrants who are in forced labor in London and um, are almost enslaved in London. And, um, uh, and and I just thought that that was kind of interesting because she uses walking as a pedagogical uh, practice to get uh, the uh, migrant women to um, to share their memories and rewalk their journeys um, because uh, they only have such little time when they can cannot be at work. So those were just things, and then I um, I, I interviewed, but it never got published. Uh, Jill Kowalczuk, I don't know whether you pronounce her name that way, but she created this app, which is called Safe in the City, and it's based around uh, a sort of crowdsourced um, thing from uh, thousands of women and um, who who uh, use the app and. Uh, uh, give over information about places which are safer in, in the cities in which they live. And it's not just in London, but it's in other cities in the world. So, so it wasn't a question, Viv, it was yeah. just... Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's just that, you know, it's um, uh, it's interesting that, that the areas that um, uh, we've heard about today, uh, this evening, uh, are being explored in other spheres and sectors too. Mm. Well, thanks, Andrew. It's good because things get a bit lost in the chat, so it's always nice to bring that up again. Um, Babak, did you have something you wanted to ask? Yeah, thanks. Um, and thanks to all three of you uh, for a um, um, very wonderful um, 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 uh, triple presentation. I have a question both for uh, Shimena and for Amanda, but I'll start with um, uh, Shimena. She, oh, sorry, Shimena. Um, on your uh, earlier project, Sounding Underground, which is going to die this year because it's based on Flash, and Flash will no longer be supported uh, by um, uh, Chrome, I think, by the end of the year, and already Safari doesn't support it uh, for a while, or at least not natively. Um, what would be required to uh, re give rebirth to Sounding Underground to make it work again? Mm. Uh, that's a really good question, and I will appreciate all help. I'm happy to collaborate with anyone to revive it. Um, it was built in ActionScript. It was programmed in ActionScript 3. And actually, in terms of sound, it has lots of programming work because ActionScript was mainly designed for image. So all, all the fades, which actually in the steps part, um, to, to really feel that interactively, that was lots of work in programming. Um, so I don't know in this moment uh, if JavaScript uh, or with particular audio libraries, uh, things that run in HTML5, um, I don't know. At the moment, I have videos and, and I have a place um, which I met in Austria to archive it, but they will archive only the video. So I have the maximum uh, video I have is five minutes, but I will make probably a longer video because you can be there for hours, really. It has about 300 and something excerpts of sounds. Um, 
and yeah it's, it's a very long long work so i will appreciate any <laughs> contact anyone who is uh, really into uh, technology and new trends to render again sounding on the ground thanks um, and then a question uh, yeah no yeah just uh, i was wondering and for amanda um, as vivian uh, also pointed out um, what part of your work or maybe a, a large part of your work is uh, focused on uh, the gender specificity of uh, psychogeography uh, and um, it's not an un uncommon uh, complaint that psychogeography is um, uh, the work of uh, uh, middle-aged white able-bodied men right <laughs> uh, yeah and um, you well you're pointing this out and uh, you're working uh, against uh, this or showing that there is more than just uh, these uh, white middle-aged able-bodied men that can do psychogeography um, which is great um, now my question is this in your uh, expertise uh, what would you um, suggest uh, or what would you think is possible to do by artists like yourselves or like ourselves um, like people who participate in um, uh, projects facilitated by these artists and the general public so these are three different audiences to work against the um, uh, established uh, not so much assumption but uh, reality that uh, psychogeography is a practice of white middle-aged able-bodied men yeah I think uh, psychogeography I see it as a medium I know that uh, perhaps the, the term was going in a very specific artistic context, which is the situationist. Uh, although there were within the situationist women doing derives, um, and unfortunately their names are not listed, but it was also an exercise of of women. So I find that psychogeography is an exercise of the human body, which don't necessarily have to be binary. Um, and, and that exercise is extremely important because it's to understand the um, elements that are creating in ourselves urban and related to urbanism, the city itself, um, that are creating distress, that are creating even pleasure, but some uh, reaction that uh, can help us also to understand a better city for everyone, right? A better city. And, and that was something that even Lefebvre uh, it was considering, like, well, maybe through, um, he didn't call it psychogeography, uh, but um, how we can walk every day in everyday life and, and read with through the rhythm, rhythm analysis and understand that the city itself has um, a, very in, a very important element of so, social economical um, relationships that must to be a study. And, and this is for all inhabitants, not only humans, but also the non-humans, the animals that live around us. And I think one of the most interesting parts in this moment is to understand the post-human, right? Uh, who is living with us in this conglomeration, in this conglomerated cities? And, and also that if the city itself was made specifically for, or the more adequate for a white man, how we can open up new reflections of new inventions so the city can also be open for uh, bodies who Maybe they cannot uh, transit, in, you know, they, they cannot go through through stairs, they cannot go through the infrastructure that has been made for a certain kind of body. So, and I think that's the value of psychogeography. We don't see it through this binary lens, but more like a tool to uh, plan and to design a better city. Right, uh, indeed, I totally agree with you. Um... Um, but that is not uh, an answer to my question, uh, as in how do we um, facilitate, I mean, th I, this is the, 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 
yeah, you're, you're right, it's a tool, but how do we get then the general public say to yeah. uh, see the necessity for this just being a tool um, uh, as opposed to, um, uh, and with that, uh, realize the limitations that uh, for many people experience of the urban environment um, uh, sets, the, the, the limits that this sets, this tool. Um, I can answer to that. Actually, um, one of my bigger part of my work is uh, to be a teacher and not only to be a teacher in universities, but to be a teacher in other contexts. So arts, pedagogical practice, practices and arts are really important in my art practice because exactly what you mentioned. Um, I think it's important that these tools are not just artistic tools, but are also actually tools that can bring, um, can bridge with other populations that maybe they're not even interested in necessarily in arts. So this, this is why I was, uh, the most rewarding experience for me doing psychogeography was with the students that I mentioned in my talk in Sunset Park and also the seniors. So I think education is an important part of this. And using these tools, not only right now, well, it's difficult because, but actually it's not because, I mean, right now we are separated in Zoom walks, in Zoom talks, right? But if we cannot be in the classroom all the time indoors, what about if we start exploring the outdoors and understanding the exploration, the walking tool as an exploratory um, tool through educational programs or through activism, as Andrew well mentioned, um, this amazing researcher with the Filipino community, that's exactly what I wanted to aim to. Take the walk not only as an artistic tool, but take the walk as an educational tool, as a tool to analysis, to collective thinking. Yeah, I think I understand what you're saying. Um, you're, um, if I may paraphrase, um, um, saying that psychogeography or um, the, the tools that psychogeography offers, use that uh, as an educational tool to show the limitations of the urban environment. Uh, uh, specifically in the context of uh, gender specificity, as you say, where, uh, and, and this is what I tried to refer to at the start, uh, it's very easy for a man to walk around in a city that might be a little bit dangerous, but for a woman it's not, it's not, or it's less so. And um, if you, are, as a man, you might not be aware of this, but you can be shown this if the tools are used uh, in an educational setting. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. Funny not being able to see anybody, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'll speak. I'm Miranda. I'm sorry. I, I can't figure out how to turn on my video because I haven't used this platform before. <laughs> <laughs> it's, but thank uh, you so yeah. much. This has been an amazing presentation. And as somebody who's new to sound walking in this format, but really excited about the possibilities, it's just very inspiring. Um, right now I'm walking in Gowanus and Carroll Gardens and Red Hook. Mm. Every oh, yeah. And <laughs> yeah, so I, I'm really fascinated by just the, well, coming out of the pandemic and being able to walk again, walking in groups walking through those places. And right now we are also going to undergo rezoning, which is going to bring more real estate development and the, the Guanas Canal is being cleaned up. So th that's my perspective. But um, yeah, if you wanted to speak any more about Red Hook, I would love to hear more about that, Amanda. <laughs> yeah, so um, I love Red Hook in, in the time, the time when I was walking, uh, working there was through educational program in the library. So how I want to invite people to walk without actually developing a relationship of trust. So I have to actually walk, uh, work there for one month before I even invite anyone to walk with me. Um, and that's really important because if you want to speak about space, if you want to speak about gentrification in a space that is not your space, then you have to actually be very humble and, and being open ex, uh, uh, to listen to their stories. So listening 
It's an important part of this. And not only listening to the sound feed recording or the, 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 the soundscape, but listening to the storytelling, the stories of people who live in that context. So instead of me walking or leading a walk, I actually, and it was not with me only, it was with um, also my um, collaborator, Aris collaborator. And um, together we actually decide, you know, let's not lead the walk. Let's ask the people who are from the neighborhood in Red Hook. We met every week. Uh, at least three weeks in the library. Let's uh, first have a little brunch, and then after that, um, conversations about mapping, like mapping the neighborhood. You know, basically us asking them if they can to, you know, share with us their experience. And then after that, we walk and we ask them to lead the walk. And we walk through areas of uncomfort and comfort. So we were walking and it's like, okay, lead us to the walk in a place that you feel comfort and why you feel comfort when we were walking. And they start telling us, and it was not only a women's walk, it was also uh, several people who, who, you know, men also joined the walk. And we have a very interesting conversations about gender, but also, ethnical um, violence that happens in the neighborhood and specifically, you know, police bias, for example. Um, and the most important part that they were mentioning is the gentrification, so that came about. But I think important, the most important part is like, be very patient and have a common point. The library is a great place because it's kind of a neutral place for people to go into also different ages. And that was the first step. And we made several walks and, um, and we did a Women League of, uh, Women League of uh, Brooklyn Walk, no, the Brooklyn League of Women Walkers, but we only did a few walks. Um, but Red Hood was a very interesting place because the relationship with IKEA. <laughs> the memory of the tornado or, you know, and, and like a several, several points that were kind of like important memories, memory, the parking memories or collective memories. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Miranda. <laughs> I'm sorry, not, not tornado, hurricane, the hurricane. That oh yeah, hurricane, yeah. <laughs> flow, flow the whole uh, neighborhood. Yeah. No, how interesting was to know more about Amanda's work and um, how in different directions um, that she takes her work and I take my work but uh, these meeting points were very interesting for me and uh, the, 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 the idea of fear um, and the moment of being paralyzed too that could be either by fear, but could be also because of the change in landscape. Uh, like, for example, the cold, people who move like from Equatorian <laughs> countries um, to live in very, very cold countries or experiencing other things, how that also affects the, the possibility of mobility. So there is, there is emotion, but there is also uh, the, the not understanding anymore how the body works because of the changes. Um, and also, I, I found fascinating the, the work of Amanda in um, bringing the collective walks. And my question is, how do you, let's say, how a, a migrant woman who is just finding their bearings when arriving into a city, particularly from cultures that are not necessarily tending to be very collective, <laughs> more individualized culture, where the idea is that you also are safe and you can go alone as a woman, even if it's not totally true, because I, I'm scared in England. Um, but if, if there are not uh, under, uh, underground transport system close by, or if there are not, um, yeah, in a small cities, I could be more scared, more similar to my native place in the night, for example, where I already know what is the time of mobility. 
So I wonder, Amanda, in your experience, how how do you break this wall, either of fear or of cold or being new to a place, to engage with other women or other people walking in the walking? Because I think it's very important to make place that, like the collectivity. In Finland, it was very interesting because it was a family tie that started that kind of conversation. But the conversation was so easy to, to start with other women. It was this common, this commonality that we had that is how we feel around patriarchy and how we feel most of the time not, um, not able to, to have this agency that you are speaking. Um, but it's, it's, you know, it's not an agency of walking. It's just an agency in general of mm -hmm. not being able to take a place with comfort, a professional place, a place in society, a, an artistic place. And, uh, you know, in that was, it, there is the most of the time when I walk with, with other women, that's the common place, the common ground. And then everybody started speaking. And then I told them like, hey, let's do this walk together so when we are walking you can you can lead us the, through the walk and they and first they are kind of a lost but once we start doing it it's it's really uh interesting how they open up to these conversations into this idea of also sometimes i i actually don't have any fear in finland but i cannot walk in my office and this very professional, uh, no, sorry, institutional office, because the most of the time I'm surrounded by men. So this kind of walk can be a symbolic meaning of the uncomfort of feeling oppressed and most of the time made very male spaces. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Well, if there aren't any more questions, I guess I'd just like to say this has just been such a treat for me. I can't tell you. I'm so happy. Thanks so much, Geert and Babak and Andrew, for giving me this opportunity to talk to two of my favorite artists. And they're such nice people, too. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, it's been great really listening to, you know, in some depth to what you do. And I could listen to hours more. But uh, I guess the time is passing and it's now... 4.30 here in New York. Uh, I'll work out what it is with you, but uh, thank you very much. Now, I think I'll pass back to Hirt now. Uh, thank you, Vev, uh, and thank you for bringing this synergy uh, together. It's a <laughs> marvelous match uh, of ideas, uh, visions, and, and works. Uh, so, um, uh, we enjoyed it every second um, of your vivid uh, conversation. Now, um, uh, thanking you in the first place, and um, uh, Jimena and Amanda, and as well, of course, everybody that uh, showed up uh, to listen and to um, uh, take part in, in this event of Sound Park uh, September. We hope to see you uh, again uh, very soon in the coming days. <laughs>